Hare Krishna. How did that first come in contact with the Hare Krishna movement? Well, <laughs> a long story. And you know, we were, uh, I, get, I was about 20 at the time um, when I first heard about Hare Krishna. Um, but I didn't really hear, I didn't relate it with the Hare Krishna movement. You know, they were, they were um, quite popular. I remember it was 1970. Um, a, record, a record came out, I don't know exactly when, but right about that time. The Hare Krishna mantra was like really famous. Um, it was on top of the pops. And that would probably be my first scene that it was. I mean, I didn't really like it. I thought that was just their dress. I didn't know anything about what they were or anything behind it. It didn't register. They were a religious group, spiritual group, or anything. It was just as, you know, people dress in funny ways. You know, it was just the way they dressed. And the next time, of course, I came across, well, we were, when we were at college at that time, you know, we were studying all sorts of, not studying, but we were really in touch with all kinds of uh, oriental and, uh, you know, esoteric things from the East, you know. And particularly where I was studying, you know, it was really, it was a bit of a revolutionary place, the college, you know. And so almost every summer, many of the students would go to India to get various things, and many of them not particularly spiritual, but uh, so the guy I was staying with, you know, he was, he was really into that. He brought back quite a few books every time he'd go. He was into kind of like, you know, mystical stuff. So he brought back these books, Mahabharata, uh, all sorts of different books, just to name a few. Different religion, Buddhism, Islam, all sorts of different kind of mystical stuff. And he would give them to me and said, you should read this. And I, I, was, just, I was a bit stubborn a bit. You know, I don't like doing things if people tell me to. If someone tells me to do something, I don't really do it. I like to be, I like to do it because I, I feel you know, compelled or inspired to do it when I'm told. And uh, I know that but when he wasn't there, I, when he'd go away, I would usually read these books. Can you hear me? I'd usually read them, you know. And uh, I, it was a little hard at first because I read the Bible and I read other things. But, the names and all the descriptions. These weren't Islam, they were, they were just books, you know, Indians, authors. But they were, they, I got really into the Mahabharata and I read the whole thing in one day, about a thousand, twelve hundred pages, maybe. Like that. And then I started reading the Ramayana and that really turned me on. I really, I mean, I really, the Ramayana really kind of, really, I mean, I don't know, it just did something to me. But besides, and as I said, it wasn't anything to do directly with it. And there are other things too. I mean, there's the hair, there's a hair um, um, musical. You know, I went to see that in London. The first, maybe not the first time, one of the first performances up there in London. And we were chanting Hare Krishna there, and we heard Hare Krishna again. It's, there was no link with the movement behind it. It was just a philosophy that you know didn't seem to have any practical or living existence. You know, you know what I mean? I didn't really relate it to anything other than. It just one of the things we were doing was really interesting. We were reading all these books, yoga, you know, Paramahansa Yogananda, you know, Autobiography of a Yogi, and Be Here Now, you know, uh, Robert Alpert, whatever his name was, all these people. And different books from here and there, you know, about something different, or something more than what we're exposed to in a normal circumstance. There's a, you know, that time in the late 60s, early 70s, it was a great time, it just was. I mean, millions of young people all over the world were just looking for something completely different. They wanted to change, not just physically, but something deeper inside many of them. And I got to come, I guess I was in that era, and there was something inside looking, searching for things. So it was the right time. And then, um, you know, they used to play at the football matches in about 70, I suppose 70, 71. I used to go to football matches. And, and the record used to be played during the interval at the football stadium. So we were kind of getting unknowingly exposed to Hare Krishna, you know, without really knowing that, you know, it was, it was actually a, a living force present and with us that was, you know, available. Um, and the first time I really came across that, you know, I, I remember at Glastonbury Festival 1971, when I was there, um, there were many big groups, I can't remember who they were, maybe Jimi Hendrix was there, I don't know who was there, so many big groups. 
The reason I don't know is because I was so intoxicated I can't remember anything about it except for that um, and a couple of other things. I got so, I, I, I mean, that was one experience I had which really changed my life also in a positive way. And I'm not recommending that everyone should do this. But I got so intoxicated with LSD, you know, I, I was completely lost. Even, even our you know, LSD guru, if you want to call it that, could do nothing. He just took me to the release tent, you know, you've heard of this release tent? And so I ended up, I didn't know where it was, I didn't know if it existed, it didn't exist where I was, everything was like a different dimension, upside down, inside out. You know, everything was just changing its form, shape, and dimension every moment. And time took on no perspective, totally different perspective. You know, I've been there a million years, or a tenth of a second, it was all, it just, it's impossible to comprehend. And I was just completely lost, I just didn't have a clue about anything. I was completely lost and it really, really slammed my false ego to the max. And I was in that tent and, and there was this one guy I kept seeing, he was dressed in long white robes and he was like, you know, Jesus or something. And he had to be the guy and then when I was in the tent, he was a guy in charge. So that gave me some sort of security. And that tent, because I was like gradually, gradually returning to so-called normal consciousness, so to speak, after, I don't know how long, I can't say, time. And uh, that, was, that was the first time I really came across something which really kind of caught me in like Krishna. And this altar in the middle of it was Krishna, the Gopal, was a cow behind playing his flute. And I just focused my mind on that all the time as we were coming down. I just captured my attention. And it so happened that in that tent at the same time as Purna Shloka and Kamalanki, two other people were really at the same time. Purna Shloka was helping in the tent, and Kamalanki was also another. <laughs> patient, so to speak. <laughs> it was funny, you know. And how many Krishnas were there about that? So I don't know if I saw them, I don't think I did. Because, you know, I pretty much lost it on the first scene, you know, before the whole thing started, you know. And it was all over by the time I came back, you know, a couple of days later, practically speaking. And then, then after that, I went to see my mates, you know, from college. And I finished up college in 71. And then I, in the summer of 71, I went to Birmingham, where a lot of my ex-college mates were living. And they were renting a place in Sutton Coalfield, it's north of Birmingham. So I went to see them, and uh, yeah, it was a bit, a bit uncomfortable, because I made a vow after that experience. I would never eat meat again or take intoxicants. Now, the reason I said I'd never eat meat, because the one thing I vividly remember from that experience was I heard of unending, unlimited cows pounding me to death in the dirt and the mud. I was going down, down, down into that some kind of howl, cows food pounding me down there, and horns sticking in me. It was a terrific experience. I mean, it's still in my mind now, I can see it if I want to. But that really shocked me up. I, I would never eat meat ever again after that. And I, never, I wouldn't eat it much anyway, but nothing at all after that. Night. I also vowed never to take intoxication of any kind after that. While well, I didn't know tea, coffee, or top, no drugs or liquor. So I, I, when I was visiting these friends, they'd become junkies. They were full on the addicts. They weren't like that in university, they were just like me, you know, just doing this and that. So they wanted me to be kind of cured with them, obviously. But I made this vow, so I said, no, I'm not. I just let them hang out with them on the weekend, it was really boring because I couldn't relate to what they were into. But I was looking for something to do basically, I was just making coffee and cooking for them, that's about it. And uh, I was looking for something to do and I found these magazines, a big pile of magazines. You know, there was these, those days amongst the, uh, the underground culture, it was like alt magazines like Oz, It, IT, Matt magazine, other things too, I remember those ones. And they, they were no longer interesting, they were just like garbage to me now. They just didn't have any meaning. I just didn't want to know about it. And uh, there had nothing there of any interest. Right at the bottom of the pile were two back to others. I pulled those magazines out from the bottom of the pile. That one was this. And then I saw a picture of Krishna, it reminded me also of that picture I saw in the release tent. And then you know, I started reading it. Everything started to make sense. Everything started to come together. You know, what I read in the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, I'd read several versions of Bhagavad Gita, but it, again, it didn't really have any practical meaning to me, like other than interest. The same thing with the Bible. And I've been praying to Jesus, actually, because I did have some faith in Jesus, although I wasn't really classified as a Christian by any means. Like something in my sight, inside I had some sort of faith in Jesus. 
I've been praying to Jesus to send some guidance or give me some direction. What am I supposed to do in my life? You know, I'm not going to carry on just like this, just be an ordinary materialistic life. It just, I just didn't want it. I, didn't, I wasn't into it. It just didn't make sense. I didn't want to become a drug addict or a revolution leader. It just didn't seem to have any value. So when I read those two back to God, I just couldn't put them down and say, so we're not ready to back to front of both of them. And they were pretty full of philosophy in those days. There were many pictures, all black and white, and page after page of articles. But I couldn't put it down. It just every word was like, you know, phew, life. It was like life came into me. And after that, and that, that was it. Life changed, frankly speaking, right away, you know. Because I heard the Hare Krishna mantra, and, and, and I didn't maybe even say it because it was in so many the books that we read as well. It didn't click on me that, you know, this was anything more than just another mantra or something. And, uh, but then after reading that, it really, really took off. I just couldn't stop chanting Hare Krishna. And I was working on a farm actually at that time in Kent. So when I went, I went back to the farm in Kent, and then I came to the town with my first, first opportunity. You know. but I came specifically by the bag, because the bag of like was advertised in the BTG. So I wanted to buy that one. Like I had a few of I wanted that one, so I came to the temple. And that's like a, what, say a chapter in itself, the first day of the temple. I don't know if you want to hear that one. That's like a chapter in itself. I never met the word in my life up to now. And I didn't really, I, 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 I wasn't even thinking in terms of those people on the TV. I, you know, wasn't, I just didn't know what to expect when I went to the temple. I really didn't know what to expect. It was like, you know, a kind of a, a bit of a suspension, a bit of nervousness, a bit of excitement, a bit of you know, <laughs> risk, and all sorts of different things were mixed in my emotions when I walked through the streets of London searching for the temple in Burry Place. And by Krishna's grace, I didn't look at the map or anything, but somehow we just ended up in Burry Place. I actually didn't look anywhere. I just, I was all puffed up with my you know, geography student, with my directional capacity. So I just walked in what I thought was the direction, and I thought, I'm lost. I don't know where I am now. I've got to ask someone. I look up to where I am and the sign said Burry Place. I was right in the corner of Burry Place. So then I walked up down the street and I could see the town. It was hidden behind a club on the left side. And then I came back and I saw it. And uh, there it was, around the Christian temple. So the door was, there was nobody around. It was just midday, it was one o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon. And I didn't know what to do. There was no one around. There was no sign telling me what to do. There was no bell. I didn't, nothing. I didn't know what to do, I wasn't quite sure what I was supposed to do. So I stood in front of the door, it's got a wooden door with a brass knob sort of in the middle. And I didn't know whether to do what I was supposed to do. And I just sort of go, so I go knock on, so try to open it, what should I do? What should I do? And I was bursting to go to the toilet. And then I thought, wow, because my idea of you know, yoga or spirituality was basically giving up eating and sleeping. I thought these guys, they probably don't eat. They probably don't eat anything. And maybe they don't even have a toilet inside. Perhaps I should go to find a toilet first before going. I was this other thing. Anyway, eventually I thought, well, I've come this way, I better do something. Let me try So I pushed the door, and before I opened the door, before I touched the door, I went to push it. It opened before I touched it. It just flew open. And it wasn't because there was any of these. Uh, what do you call these, these modern doors that open when you can go towards them? Some kind of, I don't know, across them. Yeah. Anyway, the door flew open and uh, I almost fell in because when I was going forward, my, my hand continued to follow the door in. and this wave of incense and cooking came out the door, spices and incense, poof. It was just before one, you know. I just finished the lunch, I suppose. And the artist just finished. So it's like a wave of incense and, and you know, scent of, you know, spices, you know, wow, you know. I was a little familiar with that, I used to go to the restaurants a lot, headshots, you know, incense and all that stuff. And uh, there was a, a devotee there uh, behind the door, they were just opening the door, they just happened to be going out, and so I was coming in. Well, they would open the door for some reason, I don't know exactly why. And they said, oh, welcome, you come at the right time. French woman named Wanda King. She's in front of Paris now. But she was there. She did, uh, she welcomed me in. You know, I was a bit sort of like, uh, you know, I 
I don't know if it's sort of stunning somewhat. And he said, come, come downstairs, you come at the right time. It's Prashadam time. I can't tell what Prashadam was. I have no idea what Prashadam was. I don't know why, I thought I was kind of just let off because I was, you know, I just arrived. We went down to the little tiny basement, which was a really small room. I mean, it wasn't any bigger than this room. It's not big. And uh, <clears throat> it was Prashadam time, or lunch time, whatever you call it. One o'clock, you know, the boys were all sat around honoring Prashadam. It was amazing. I never, I couldn't believe my eyes. There were all these bald, maybe a dozen bald headed men, and maybe half a dozen ladies in Cyrus, and what, maybe more of a bird around that. And they were all like very, the, the plates they had were like mountains. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a devotee sat there serving Prashadam. His name was Sananda Kumar, and he was the server sat in the far corner of the room in front of a little table with three or four pots in front of him, putting it on the plate and giving everyone a plate, you know. The first went on the rice, a big stack of rice, I mean it really was big, and then a big stack of, of uh, chapatis on top, and uh, one litre, I'm not joking, a one litre bowl of dal, and then that was lunch. And in the dal was whatever they could put, there was no budget for food in the temple practically. So the day just got a little bit. It was the the the, the cutting off apple peel, you know, the stems of the cauliflowers, anything that was edible went in there. Basically speaking, the doll that was like you know, the vegetables. If there were any vegetables left over, they would go in there. Because Maha was a rare tea. I was like, you know, I found that it was very rare. You got Maha in those days, um, and then um, so I said, what am I going to do? I wasn't a big eater. I was quite a small eater. Very, these some of steer the old years, and they uh, they gave me this. He gave me his plate, so I gave me this plate. Oh, God, I'd never eaten so much in my life, literally, before that. So I think, and I looked, everyone else was like eating like crazy. So I took this plate and sat down. No one spoke to me anything. I sat there and looked at them. I hear down to my waist. You know, I was eating this way. I was getting embarrassed because everyone had finished, they were asking for more. And I was, what am I going to say? This is a huge amount, but somehow they managed to finish it off. I couldn't take any extra, but I managed to finish the whole lot with the gaming. Because I was trained by my father never to leave a grain of rice on the plate. Never. You couldn't leave a table until everything was finished. I wish people would do that now sometimes. So anyway, we finished off the plate somehow. Or and then I, was, I came for a bag of a gita. I asked someone in the bank of the gate, said, sorry, we're out of stock. We have no stock left. They didn't have one anyway. I said, then they said, well, would you like to come on Sankirtan? I said, what? Sankirtan? I said, what's that? Oh, it's blissful, it's exact. That's all they said. They were named Swineboy from Australia. And, you know, Canberra, Australia. He, he invited me to come on Sankirtan. And I, I said, I know what to do. I was like, you know, it was all happening too quickly. I didn't have a kind of time to think about it practically. And whoosh, we're out the door and we're on Oxford Street on Sankey Town. And just within an hour, we're coming to the temple. We're doing it on Harry Now, you know, at the back of the line, we used to go to Harry Now. And I'm looking, where's the bliss and ecstasy? I didn't think I, They weren't even singing Harry Krishna half the time. I kind of knew that mantra, but I didn't know anything else. I don't know what they were singing. I know they sang Sansara Dab at one point in time. That much I they were singing others, I guess it was like Govind the Jai, Jai, Gopal, Nithar Gaur, Hari Paul, Hari Hari, Nama Krishna. I don't know, they sing all sorts of stuff. It wasn't that. They were used to sing Isha Upanishad sometimes. Isha, Sim, Dham, Sam, on the street. You know, and she probably said he could do it. You know, she said he could sing Vedic mantras on the street from Isha Upanishad and so on. So they were singing these different things. And I don't know, I couldn't follow them when I was at the time. I was at the back. So our movement was pretty, uh, let's say, not very uh, well known in those days, in one sense, at least not favorably well known. And I could hear everything that people were saying and doing. I get a lot of negative comments. And I was at the bank, so I was I wasn't the sort of person who liked to expose myself to that sort of stuff. I really was quite shy about public exposure, completely shy in general. And it was a little bit overwhelming in one sense because I couldn't Get into I just nobody said anything. I wasn't getting any kind of like direction as to what really is to be done or not done. 
We got to Oxford Circus and I just said, well, that was interesting, but I'd better get back to the temple. I've got a train to catch. And I left my coat back at the temple, in very place. And uh, I was just about to go go, actually. And again, it's fine, it's the same town leader that day. He came up to me and he said, here, take this. And he put a madunga over my neck. He just slung this madunga straight over me. And what am I supposed to do with this? He says, play it. I don't know how to play this. He says, it's dead easy. You just go like this. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. So that's why, like, oh no. And then he disappeared. All, almost all the ladies, one man stayed, and all the other men, they disappeared. I was there with one man, three ladies on the party. man at the front, I think, was leading, and the three ladies in between, and me at the back. And one of the ladies had a baby screaming his head off in front of me. Another lady in the middle looked like she was having some nervous breakdown. She was like, going all over the place, bumping into people and screaming and all sorts of things. It was quite a bizarre party, and I'm at the best one, boom, 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 you know. Got the front singing to himself on the cartels, and I'm at the back, you know, I go, what is this? This is more bliss and ecstasy. What are you doing here? And the people were looking at us and swearing and bitting, and it was really the spot. I couldn't get the Madonna to anyone, you know. There's a woman with a baby and a crazy lady and a guy playing in the cartel and the other lady on what she was doing, I can't remember it. You know, I couldn't do I didn't know what to do. I was stuck there and I couldn't see anyone around. All the other boys had gone out distributing BTGs and stuff, you know. And then we ran all the way to Mark Lodge and we moved pretty slowly. This was like about two hours later practically. You know, after we started, almost two hours, maybe an hour and a half to get to Mark Lodge. You know? Oh, wow, this is going to go on forever. You know, <laughs> come, come, get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> and then Schweinberg came back and he said, What is this? And I said, What is what? <laughs> he said, This sounds more like a funeral procession. Then went boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I thought, Well, here, take your drum, take this drum back, put yeah, it back on his shoulder, you know. And I just. Ran for it and disappeared down the underground. My well, I went back to the you know, court road or wherever it was and uh, went back to the temple. And uh, I got back to the temple at 4.15. And at 4.15 was just at the end of the art, you know. I don't know who it was, it was a Brigari came out to play. Ma was up. And they said, Oh, you're back already. And it's a senior for Charlton. And they said, Oh, you can come up anyway. Come with me, come with me. I said, Downstairs, come on. So what's this? I said, you'll see in a minute. And they gave me the fruit mark, you know. And I, I like that because I like fruit even though I just eat a big lunch. I, I took the fruit and I went, wow. I thought, wait a minute. Have they put LSD in this? Because I know the effects of LSD. My mouth started watering, I started tingling. I thought, they put LSD in this fruit mark. It happened in a few moments. Of course it was. It was love, loving. Devotions, um, but it was it was an amazing experience. I was a very happy there. But then I said, okay, I've got to go. I was like, okay, I'm going to train. I know the train, but I had to go anyway. So I went upstairs. Just as I was about to go out, a devotee came down the stairs, and his name was Diamond. He was a temple president, I found out later. Tall devotee, maybe six foot two or three, maybe more. Very tall. Very angelic. His face was big. He looked just like that person I saw in Glastonbury with a long white beard. He looked just like without the beard. He had a very amazing presence. And he said, Oh, Hare Krishna, could you please help me for a little while? He said, I said, Oh, what do you want? He said, Oh, we have a big order of incense. I, I, I need someone to help pack the incense. Could you help, please? So I said, Oh, right. I went up the stairs, four or five flights of stairs up to the top of the building. It was about a six-story building. And I got to the top and sat in the little room. It was almost half the size of this one. And there I was packing incense for the next hour and a half. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty into the packet. That you know, it was like that. About an hour and a half. Speaking of ladies, like that. We did that for an hour and a half. It was amazing. I really liked it. It was like something I could do, and it was a nice atmosphere. So I stayed there until about six o'clock doing that. And then I said, I've got to go next, thank you very much. 
And so I started to leave, and just as I went to go out the door, the Sanctum party returned. In they came. Hey, here you are, we wonder where you went. Come on! They just like swept me back down. Where are we going? Push, come downstairs. We're back in every shop. And it was the same as lunch, rice, dal, and chapanis. It was the leftovers. And we again, we stuffed ourselves with rice, dal, and chapanis. And I said, I really want to go. I've got a train to catch. And they said, oh, but just a little bit longer. We have a program in the temple. I said, what do you mean, temple? What temple? You haven't seen the temple? I said, no. But no one told me and showed me a temple up to this point. Temple room, that is. I said, just wait a little while. He said, you can sit in there for now. In 20 or 30 minutes' time, there's going to be a very special ceremony. You should see it. So I sat there watching the sights going on as I was sitting in the temple room with devotees like diving in, offering obeisances and all kinds of weird things going on. And then at 7 o'clock, the curtains opened. Rock some blowing the horn, and then the arts began. Jagannath Baladev Sabhadra up in the air above Radha and Krishna. They used to have a platform in the up. And Radha and Krishna were there. I mean, I kind of seen Radha and Krishna picture. That did face me, but Jagannath Baladev Sabhadra was like, wow, what is that? It was like, you know, you can imagine it. They looked like some voodoo. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. And nobody really explained anything to me up to this point. Even when I was packing incense, it was one that always sat with me. All he talked about was the ten offences against chanting. He kept saying, you have to avoid the ten offences when you chant. I wasn't I mean, I was chanting, but I wasn't chanting like that. And he kept on going and telling me I had to avoid the offences. That's all he talked about. And he didn't know what they were either. That was the funny thing. When he was asked what they were, he had no idea what they were. He just kept on repeating the same thing. Kind of funny. Here's the new one. And uh, then the curtains opened and the RT began and the were jumping up and down. You know, really wild. And the curtain came the RT was going, and someone came and stuck a flame in my nose and what the heck was going on? You know, <laughs> and jumped at first. I just didn't know what it was happening. And, then, and a few minutes later they, they came and swearing water at me. And it was, I mean, to put the flame out maybe, you know, maybe they thought maybe I caught on fire or something. And they stuff a flower up your nose and they wave some kind of thing at you and you blow this horn in the air. You know, it's like it's really weird, you know, when you look at it, you're not used to that sort of thing. It's like, I mean, I'm mystical. I can, I, I can mind it, it's kind of being mystical. I didn't have a clue what's going on. And then I said, I, I, okay, I've got to go now. So, you know, I said, I've got to go now, I've got to catch a train. He goes, just stay a little longer. I said, what, what, what for? I said, bang, I need to pass now. <laughs> I said, I'm going to come to get a bag if I need it. Maybe at least I can listen to the class. So I stayed to listen to the class. We went on to 8.30, one hour. And then at the end of the class, I said, I'm going to go. I said, well, it's just a little bit longer. We're having a song class now. So I stayed for the song class. They had this song class from 8.30 to 9. Stayed for that. I said, I really want to go. I said, no, just, just one more little. There's a little sound. It's very short by this time. Just 10 minutes. Just stay a little 10 minutes more. That's all. I said, I stayed about 10 minutes, it was about 10 past 9 now. And uh, now I said, 10 past my last train, I really going to go, 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 please let me go. You know? I said, well, just one more thing before you go. I said, what's that? Come downstairs. I knew what that meant by now. <laughs> I didn't have to ask, it was Prashad. And then we went downstairs for Prashad again. But he said, this is very special. This is the Maha. He said, this is reserved for the guests. And you're the only guest tonight. This is for you. Again, you need a plate full of samosas, halva, puris, chutney, tomato chutney, maha, brinjal, madu, and maybe hot milk or something. But seven absolutely delicious preparations. Unbelievable. I've never tasted anything in my life like it. It completely blew me out. It blew me out. I just I've never tasted anything like this before. It was absolutely I mean, pretty much indescribable the, the experience. I mean, I guess everyone gets when they first get such experience and first time getting this amazing preparation. You know. I mean, I've been in the restaurant many a time, I've never tasted like this, you know, no way. It was incredible. 
And although I did leave that night, I was, I was actually convinced that day, or whatever, that first day in the temple, completely convinced of this is it. I went back and uh, I actually obtained, maybe at that time, I can't remember, but I obtained a Krishna book from a Mokok bookshop off Tottenham Court Road. And I had that with me with the BTGs, I did a few other BTGs I picked up here and there. And I would just chant the BTGs and the farm until the season ended. So seventy-one, and then I went. I would go to the temple location. I started then to get rid of it. I started to, you know, to be used chanting, and then I moved back to my hometown in Swindon. I was living with my parents for a few months. I got a part-time job in Swindon, and I, I was. I, but I was adopting as much as I could at home everything that I was did. You know. I would get up in the morning at four o'clock, or take a cold bath, uh, sleep on the floor. My parents were convinced I was going mad, crazy. And I wasn't eating anything they were cooking. I was a strict vegetarian. I was offering all to Krishna. And I would cook. I would have halibut every morning for breakfast. Hot steam, halibut, bananas, dates, and hot milk for breakfast. And cycle to work. I was working in the time at the time, just doing a clean job. And then after that, when I come back at night, I would cook. You know, so well, I didn't really know any picture values, I just kind of did what I could and tried to make something more like a karate lunch at night when I get back with some vegetables and some lentils and rice. Cook like as much as I could. I didn't have a recipe book in, I was just trying to kind of imitate what they were. I, I did get a recipe for how I couldn't miss that. I did that every morning. I became a connoisseur of cooking how I put home all different types of habits. Couldn't resist it. And at night we just take that lunch time. A sandwich or something like that, it doesn't much. But I'd be chanting all the time at work, so I just don't clean, so I just bring I come back, and I did eventually get a letter from Gita, you know, second year in the temple or something, and I would read it all every time, every spare moment at work, I'd be reading the Bible and Gita, I'd keep my pocket, not waste a moment, you know. Chant on the site, or chant wherever I was going, twice a chanting, you know. and I went on for about oh, four months, I suppose. And and I told my mother, maybe beginning of the year 2072, uh, I told my mother I decided to find a temple. And I was going every month or every two weeks, I'd try to visit the temple. And I'd stay occasionally overnight. And uh, it's just for more and more familiar with the lifestyle, just to see if I could actually do it before going. And uh, then in about January of 72, I told my mother I'm going to join the temple. And I went to the temple. She didn't believe me. And she said, I was just for whatever reason. But then I kept getting her warnings uh, three weeks to go, a month, two weeks to go, one week to go, six days, five days, four days, she still wouldn't. And maybe she was just, didn't know what to say, I don't know, she never responded much. And then when the day came, I said, today, I told you, it's, it's the date I'm joining the temple, it was March 22. And I said, today I'm joining the temple, and uh, I was off. I took my little bag with much, just about left, left my back, went to the temple. She was freaked out, freaked out. I found her family down and said, Look, if he doesn't like it, he'll be back, don't worry. And if he likes it, yeah, it's okay, if he's happy, don't worry about it. He knows what he's doing, he's all done to make his decisions now, he's like, and mum was freaking out. Well, what the fuck do you think of me? What will they say? You do, I'm oh, so embarrassed. And she was freaking out. Screaming. My brother was cussing. We didn't like that really. We were, you know, a different group that was also very against it. And my father was trying to calm down. And uh, anyway, I just went. I decided I went. Shaved up that night. I think it was a Saturday, I can't remember. But the next morning we were out on book distribution in Rose Court and Prophet's Krishna books. They just got shit on Krishna books and we were out the next morning just to go door to door. And Rose Court, I remember it was Rose Court. <laughs> Going door to door. They hardly ever distributed one. I actually distributed one book on the first morning, which was one more than anyone else. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't made, the guy just said that much of it. I don't know. Five times was on, he just gave me a fire and took the book, you know. That was all I was saying, pretty much. I didn't know what to say, but that was my first thing to So. And when I first came to the temple, it was probably the end. First, my first trip to the temple was probably late September, 71. 
and Prabhupada just left. I can't say exactly, but I think he was, Prabhupada was there in early September or something, in 71. He just left the week before I first came, so I never saw him in 71. Um, and then, and then he, he didn't come again until, I suppose, the end of June in 72, beginning of July, I don't know, but about that time. So after I joined the temple, it was like, it was quite easy for me because I, for like four or five months I'd already been basically doing the same thing, you know, cold showers, getting up early in the morning, chanting 16 hours. You know, it wasn't like a big transition for me, it was like natural um, at that time. You know. And uh, I was also very keen for service, that's why I joined, I wanted to do the service. So I've got lots of services soon to join, all kinds of services. Anything you're asked to do at that time. And I was ready for submission at that time. That's why I decided I decided I wanted to submit. It was my feel like I'd been forced. That's what I wanted to do. And that's basically voluntary surrender or voluntary acceptance. In a sense. So it was great, you know. And, and uh, I think by then Dan and Jaya became the president. Around about that time when I joined. Maybe Dan Andrew was still the president when I joined. Kind of in the spring of 72, Dan and Jaya came became present, very close. Um, and it was just amazing, it was just very wonderful experience to stay there, going on Harry now. But after about a couple of weeks in being in the temple, they asked me to, to kind of take the practical responsibility for spiritual style. Spiritual style was run by Suda Jaya, a French devotee, who was actually running it, but the practical side, you know, all the work. So, I had to take responsibility for that. I, had, I suppose I had a little bit of, you know, not to experience, but a little bit of time togetherness in that regards, you know. Some of the girls were really not into it, or they were too busy in other ways, or they just, you know, they just weren't that kind of person. Um, so I was busy with that for pretty much the next three or four months, at least up until initiation. I was pretty busy with that. Um, and uh, it was very nice. And this is an interesting thing, one of our assistants who came to visit the temple that time, he was, he was just visiting, his name was Pankajambri later on. He became, you know, famous Pankajambri from Mayapur. He, he used to help me packing incense. And we, were in, we had a little warehouse in a place called Shoreditch in East Brook. And he, he sometimes would come, he was on his way to India to join his brother, that was his intention. His first stop was very place. He used to help me make incense for a while, but then he went off to India. Um, so, many things, so many things we could talk a long time on. Some of the interesting experiences of those first few months, as everybody probably could. It's like, you know, the first few months in the temple seem like years. They really seem like years, in a sense. You know, but the things that happen in a few months are just things that don't, they don't happen over years nowadays. At least by my life, but it's just incredible. Um, and make changes and different events that take place and so on and so forth. Different Harry Nam experiences. I would like to go on Harry Nam every moment as soon as I could, as soon as I get the incense done real quick and you know, get out on Harry Nam. And then uh, also books, when books, small books started coming in. And uh, really, you know, maybe the competitive streak started to revolve with me and I used to try to do a lot of books on the street. You know. Saturday at least, or after incense. And you know, we would stay up late night sometimes. Just, just the mood, all the mood of the temple was, you know, like for Buddha. This is a, you know, this Buddha's going to say the world. They weren't just doing it because, you know, it's spiritual, or, you know, what else am I going to do? Or, you know, it's good for society. We were actually thinking they were saving the world. I thought that was so, I mean, it was coming through to us in London at least. You know, Major mission. You know, we haven't got a minute to waste, or a penny to waste. I think it was like really down to the line, and uh, it was really, it was really exciting. It was really challenging to say the least. And then we we heard that Rafa was coming, and uh, naturally we started to pace up. And then I don't know. And the June or beginning of July, the Rafa eventually arrived. That was quite an experience. We went. And they were going to have a big um, reception for Prabhupada and Heathrow. So they, um, Dan Jagger, or where we, Jagger, we saw him, uh, they'd arranged this reception room at Heathrow Airport for Prabhupada when he arrived.
die so you go straight in there and they'd invite a lot of press people maybe some photographers maybe television I don't know different types of you know people that read your work to come um, to whatever film interview whatever to the problem a lot of maybe a hundred words hope to come that was their hope maybe they would come that was their hope so we were sent out uh, to the airport four of us five of us five of us were sent to the airport and we went out and we made insects down we made spiritual spray insects down it was the only vehicle we had at the time to the airport and uh, to the Jaya Jaya Ri two or three Six of us. Um, dear Nayaka, Swami Bhu, Mahavishnu, and myself. Thank you. And we all were given, we went early, maybe two or three hours before Prabhupada was expected to arrive to get the place ready, clean it up, arrange all the chairs, chairs and tables, and just get everything ready. We, we took Prabhupada's Vyasa Sana. Right? We had to take the pieces, I don't to get it out of the temple or to get it into the vehicle or both. It was in pieces when we got to the Hall. So we had, one of the reasons we went earlier was to get the Vyasa sign ready at the time. So Swami Bhur and Mahavishnu, they were not in the uh, responsibility of putting up the Vyasa sign. Dear Knight was in charge of Prashad, I was in charge of chairs and tables, Jairi was in charge of official clearances for Sri Prabhupada. I don't know if Sri Jairi, maybe he wasn't there actually, I don't know. I think he was there, but maybe not. But uh, so he wasn't in the hall. Um, and then um, we started doing everything, we tidied up everything first. And then so I started to arrange the chairs and then I was setting up all the arrangements so the prashad could be, you know, easily served. But lots of prashad and bubbles, feast in the right place. And uh, now Mishnah and Swango were putting up Prabhupada's Vyasa sign. You know, putting it together, screwing it up or something. Like and it wasn't long after we started doing that that uh, Janari came running in the back of the door, the back of the hall, and said, Prabhupada's already here! Come back home. I thought maybe this was, you know, sometimes they say fire, it's like a test run to see if you're ready for it, you know? Um, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was true. Uh, but I was like stunned at first. I, I, you know, I mean, just a new guy, you know, in the temple for four months or so. And, uh, you know, I don't know, what, supposed to, what am I supposed to do now? You know? Am I supposed to do something about it? Or what? You know what? <laughs> and, and within seconds of the same, I probably walked in the door. Within seconds. And he walked in the door, it's almost an empty room, there were a few chairs. The Vyasa sign was partially constructed. The table of Prashad was on the other side to me, I was on one side of the room, that was on the other side, the Vyasa sign was on my right. Prabhupada came in on the left side. And he looked and he just walked straight, I was watching, I hid behind the chairs, a stack of chairs in front of me, I hid behind him. And I was just like, God, what's going to happen now? Maybe he'll talk to me or something. I was like, what's that going to happen? Because my, you couldn't see my mission. Michael, they were behind the house. I'm doing like I was hiding behind the shadow. And I'm hiding behind the chair, so there's nobody in the room, visible, practically speaking. And Prabhupada looked and said, walk straight up to the Vyasa and sat the Vyasa oh my God. I thought it was going to fall to pieces because it wasn't fully ready, you know. And now we should have been behind it, practically putting their chest on the Vyasa and practically holding it together with their hands. And Prabhupada sat, I don't know if you saw it or not, but they were behind the Vyasa. And he sat there and he looked around and he said, the servant was there now. Another Kumar. Pajuna and Nanda Kumar and Kamal Prabhupada, I think it's Sam Sumi was also there. Kamal Prabhupada. And uh, they said that uh, he asked uh, Jayari, who was the like, secretary of our temple basically, he asked him, where are all the devotees? I could hear him. He said, where are all the devotees? Jayari said, they're at the temple, Sri Prabhupada. We thought you were coming a couple of hours time. We didn't know. Uh, it was about 9.30 maybe in the morning. Probably it was due about 11 o'clock. She said, they're still at the temple. And I said, oh. So then we would go to the temple. He didn't care. Fresh food. No. He just decided to go to the temple. So but before he went to the temple, he noted that there were some pots of Rashad in what is this. And this was actually the Rashad of the you know, reception for it. The fellow indicated, it's just 9 o'clock and he hadn't taken breakfast, so he called for a plate of prashadam, so they brought him prashadam and did a bit of each preparation. Prabhupada really liked it, you know, he watched him there eating a fantastic plate, I think he was just eating away. And then he called Nanda Kumar to bring his tiffin, you know, this metal tiffin, and he told him to go and fill up the tiffin with his cheer, chanta. He liked it very much, it was crispy, you know, and 
dal and peanuts and fried potatoes and raisins and all kinds of spicy crispy things. He really liked that and he took the whole container of his chicken back to the temple. And then uh, they, they then I don't they didn't know, but I presumably they went back in that vehicle because we didn't have a vehicle. We were stuck there till like three or four in the afternoon. Until anyone until anyone got it together to come and bail us out. Because we had no money, no thing, no phone, nothing. We were stuck there and like, putting all the chairs back where they were before, putting all the tables back and everything else, waiting for them to come and pick us up, you know. <laughs> we missed everything. We missed our electric, we missed the feast when we got back, there wasn't a single grain of rice left. <laughs> we were stuck there all day. <laughs> but it was like an interesting experience. That's the first time I saw Prabhupada. And then, it wasn't long after that, it was Rathiatra, and Prabhupada generally tried to come for Rathiatra in his day. He came for Rathiatra in 72, 73, of course, as well. In 72, um, it the same thing, we had an initiation on the Prabhupada Square. So Dan tried to propose my name for initiation. You can be a drum rancher of all his book. You can do that. I have a name. If you haven't read that, I can tell the story briefly. Um, we had this Rathiatra, and I, that day, I was distributing books on the Rathiatra. Usually, how they distribute books, all these things, I don't know what to do anything. So, I was having distributing books on the way, you know, so I didn't really participate in the town or the session much. I was usually get caught, stuck behind talking to people, you know, and you arrive. So, I eventually about to reach the square in time for the initiation. So, you know, imagine the Trafalgar Square, we're right there on the plinth. There was no legal permission for all of this, you know, having fires on Trafalgar. Square are illegal. You know, but it's not when I used to get away with it in those days for a while. And uh, so that everything was set up, Prabhupada was set up as Vyasa San. There are pictures of this. And uh, he's, he's on the Vyasa San. And then he um, gives a lecture, of course, which is to the public. There was thousands of people stood in front of us. It was a lovely day, by the way. Maybe 30 of us sat there. Quite a few. I think carefully some of the devotees here were probably on that same plinth. Um, I think Mahavishnu was taken second, maybe not, but I think it was probably Vishnu was taken second. There were about five or six taken second initiation and a lot taken first, Diranaka, Duranga, Dirashanta, Vajendra Kumar, and then a bunch from other um, Vichitavaria, a whole bunch of devotees taken first initiation or second initiation, Partha. So many boys were there, you know. and uh, and some from Europe came from Germany and and uh, and uh, Holland, I think, came also that year for initiation. Um, altogether, about thirty devotees, I'd say, around about thirty taken first, maybe twenty-five to thirty taken first. Probably half a dozen taken second initiation. And uh, Prophet gave his lecture. Can't remember what it was. It's probably recorded. And then after the lecture. Naturally, he called the devotees up and they were called. Prajuna was Prabhupada's Sanskrit secretary, you could say. He was the one overseeing the, the ceremony. So he was calling us up like, three at a time because, you know, I speed things up a little bit, you know, call three names at a time. So he called out three names, and my name was one of the first three. I don't know who the others were, but we went up to get our names and be so we had hope of getting a name. Some beads anyway. And when we got up there, Prophet noticed we had no neck beads on. So he said, Where are the neck beads? And we didn't have any neck beads. So he said, we'll Go back and get neck beads. So then we had to go and sit down again. We went up and went and sat down. And then someone got some neck beads together and started putting neck beads on us. So we had neck beads. And then, uh, then the names, Prajuna had this bag, it was kind of really, it was quite a tatty bag, it was a cloth bag, one of those Indian cloth bags, you know over his shoulder and he had all the beads inside there. And the beads had like a little tag next to them with a name, the your Kami name plus your new name, on a bit of paper tagged to the beads. You know. So he was calling the names out, he pulled three sets of beads out and called three devotees. You know. So he started all over again, just put the beads back in the bag and started from scratch for some reason. And so he started calling them out again, you know, three by three by three and I'm sat in there in the room. Looking around, it seemed like everybody had got their beads. And there was only one or two left, and he called out one or two. He didn't mention my name, he didn't call it out. 
well and there. Was he recorded before it didn't come out on the second call? And then, you know, I just sat there, but I was quite near the back of the lines, lined up in front of the, you know, the, uh, the young uh, kund. And uh, I don't know what I supposed I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know? <laughs> I'm looking around and kind of like a cold sweat of some kind, you know. And I'm looking around and there's thousands of people over there, there's Prabhupada over there, there's all these devotees looking kind of like a little bit, maybe a bit dazed because it's like quite an event. You've got an SCD with Prabhupada went and took all the square of the whole looking kind of contented as such. I'm stuck in kind of like bewildered apprehension. What's, what's happening? I don't know whether to do it. The thoughts that run through my head were, oh, you can't cheat Krishna. You are just a cheat. You do it all along and now the proof is there. That kind of thought was going through my head. I thought, oh God, it's a stone floor. If I could just bury my head in that floor, I would do it right now. But it was a stone, solid stone plinth. You know? And I can't leave, it's too embarrassing. I can't stay. What am I, what am I going to do? Throw myself in a fire? I didn't know what to do. You know? I, just, I felt completely, like, you know, Oh, the health of some one sense of me. I wasn't in, I, I, I felt like this exactly what was meant to happen. I didn't have any fear or anger or any sort of thing like that. It was just I just thought the truth is the truth and you can't get away with it. You know, be an imitation. You know. So anyway, we started and they started and the children started the yogi, I started chanting the mantras and the grains were going in the fire and everyone's throwing their grains kind of towards the fire at least. And I'm pretty much the back. Do. And I can't, I can't do it. I just went along with it. I just started throwing grains in the fire, put the banana in the fire, and everything. I don't, I just didn't know why. You know, nobody said anything. Daddy Joe was off somewhere else organizing the other parts of the festival, so he didn't notice. Even if he was there, he probably wouldn't notice. There were so many devotees. Things were going on, so, so kind of like, it's done. And then uh, at the end of that, everyone got up, you know, and everyone's coming up, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name, Prabhu? What are you now? Yeah, Dave, what's your name? Oh, Dar Dar Dai Dai Rongo or you know they nobody nobody knew what the name was, you know, it's like a bit of paper but how to pronounce it, you know. And uh then Dan and Jerry came up to me and said, What's your name, Jeff? And I said, Jeff. I know it's Jeff, but what's your new name? Jeff. <laughs> he said, Come on, what's your name? I said and then explain what happened. Really? Just hold on there, he said. Something like that. And he ran off to the journal. He was just about to leave with Prabhupada. And he was just about to go into the car. I went back to the temple. And the journal and Dan and John Elk, they spoke. They spoke they were over the car. So he said, wait here, I'll come back. And uh, obviously what he spoke about was the fact that someone that I hadn't been initiated, but it was supposed to be initiated. I saw, I didn't sit here, but I could see what was going on. And I understand that Prajuna said, oh, everyone's name's been given, I've got no beads left, my bag's empty. And the next thing, he put his hand in the bead bag, and, oh, out came the beads. And then he went back in the bag again, and then Dan and Jai came back and said, because uh, then Prajuna talked to Prabhupada, as he was sitting in the car, and then Dan and Jai came back and said, Prabhupada wants you to go back to the temple right away. And I didn't know what that meant. I thought maybe he's going to tell me, get out of here and never come back again. You demon. I didn't know what he was going to say. I really didn't know. And that thought was going to my mind. And uh, anyway, I went back to the temple. I ran back to the temple, about one or two kilometers, I suppose, to Flower Square, maybe, back to Barry Place. And I got back there, and I, there was hardly anyone there, because everyone was still on to Flower Square, because the festival carried on. But I just left after the initiation. And there's a very, very few that was there, maybe two or three, if that. As I sat outside Prabhupada's rooms, Prajuna came in and he said, just wait here. And uh, then he went back in. After some time, I don't know how long, it's like, you know, when you're sitting there, it's like sitting outside a dentist's, you know, a dental appointment, it seems like it goes on forever when you're sitting out there, you know, <laughs> and you're eternal. And I was kind of a little bit apprehensive, and I didn't know what to expect. I was sat there, and Pianando, another devotee, was there talking to me, asking what was going on. But was, my mind was a little bit too, you know, kind of tense to really relax and have a proper conversation. And then all of a sudden, Pajola came out after a while and said, Okay, you can come in now. I thought he was going 
Kanye with me because I had a kind of a relationship with Pujama, someone that I really I kind of liked him. And he kind of spoke to him a few times before that very place. And uh, then we, uh, if he didn't go in, he, he just shut the door behind me and I was alone in the room with Prabhupada. You know, about the size of this room or so. Similar room in some ways, in very place. <laughs> you know, I was like stood there and Prabhupada looked at me and I went over to his Vyasa Sam. He was Vyasa on his ass and we were sitting with a table in front. And then he bowed down before she could Prabhupada. And uh, I sat there and Prabhupada looked at me and he said, So? What are the four regulated principles? I managed to remember what they were. How many rounds in total? And then he said, no, they did say it. They just came in the beats and said, your name is Jamal. And so I got my beats. They weren't even made of wood, some of them were made of dough. In those days we didn't all have wood. I had a mixture of wooden beads and dough, bread and, bread and water baked in the oven, rolled around the string. Probably chanted on those beads and gave me those beads. Gave me a little bit of paper, was, was already on there, um, with the name on me. He told me the meaning of the name. And one who gives pleasure to all the beings, all beings, and Krishna Das. And then he gave me a big Simply wonderful. He had a tip in it. on his table again, and so this was full of simply wonderfulness. He gave me a huge simply wonderful. And I bowed down, he said, Put the beads on the table, and I'll feel basically his property, and put his hands on the floor. So I did that. And I fell from the basic system, departed with the, with the beads and the simply wonderful. That was my message. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Favorite pastimes of Lord Krishna, um, all of them, because they, they sometimes, in different stages, different pastimes are relevant. I look at the pastimes in a certain angle, and maybe others do too, but I don't just look at them from the point of view of you know, this is funny pastime or this is kind of exciting pastime, very special pastime, they're all special, exciting, funny, all, etc., etc., etc. I look at them. Probably I digest things when they seem to be relevant to me now. So at different stages, different pastimes would be more relevant to me. So at this stage, um, which pastimes are really relevant to me, Krishna, I don't really have any specifics right now, I'm going through a different stage, but, but for a long time, one of the most relevant pastimes to me was like, was my little brother stole the cow, the cows and the cow, the cow boys. That pastime really almost fascinated me for a long time. And partially because his relationship a lot to do with in fact his relationship with Haridas Thakur. Because Haridas Thakur, from a very early stage in my devotional life, together with Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Nurash and Raghunath Daskar Swami, were extremely significant in my let's say feelings of inspiration and kind of like some kind of attraction to their associations. I was quite strong even from the very early days, more than others in the like that, um, more than Krishna, in direct, in directly speaking, I very attracted to their association, those three personalities specifically. Then it became more specific, it became more Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj and Haridas Thakur. So I was always fascinated about Haridas Thakur and you know, his actual identity. So I, 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 it's just something I wanted to do. I just went a little bit deeper into that past time and brought up the Mohana Lila that one would normally do anything like that. And the past time became more and more intriguing and more and more, let's say, interesting, absorbing, the more I looked into it. The same in Haridastra Chronicles, interrelated. But not going to speak much about that, more than that really. At other times, there are times, there are times pretty much. Mostly it's, uh, in my case, I would say, um, because I'm still a very neophyte to what has been, probably more the killing of demons has been more of a, an, an attraction for me. The demonic mentality, neophyte mentality. You know, killing Christian chastise and covenants and infatuation for me at one time. So you're talking about Christian directly. 
In Chaitanya, we know that it's something past time there, it came from time for the river, that's what it is at that time. And I know already saw it back in the specific ones, they're all past time for all night. Not much higher past time for all. But these type of moods, um, particularly, Tapparuta Maharaj is one which really captivates my, my mind. I like to put them in dramatic form. I would recommend, suggest any devotee, whether you know all or whatever it is, try to have an expression of the attraction to Krishna according to what Krishna has given us, the means to, to express those attractions. Just like my mantra over here, he's poetic, so he should be writing poems about Krishna or about devotional service, music, we should. We may be sometimes, of course, we may have to go through some, let's say, apprentice stage in our lives. We're all still in apprenticeship in terms of doing all kinds of services and just getting in, in a line of some kind of devotional service itself. But, you know, recognizing that Krishna has given us all talents and abilities, they should be used in service. And if possible, they should be used in service. You know, it should be done in a way that's like offending others or disobeying one's spiritual authorities, no doubt. But in principle, they should be used. Because I find that unless they're used, there's a great risk we'll become, you know, dry. You know, some other unfavorable kind of attitude may creep into our lives. Sometimes even envy, or whatever it may be, lack of satisfaction. So I found that to a large extent that one of the significant changing points, because I've never really known as an particularly a Kirtan man or any time for the God Harry now, I suppose, along whenever I could, but I was never really known in that regards. Although I kind of liked it. Maybe in recent years I've been a bit more involved in the world of Kirtan. I used to like to read, I was quite one of those reading, you know, reading and studying of the books in the earlier years, which was really good. I, I still like that. Um, but what happened when maybe in the nineties, but late in one sense, but Sometime in the 90s, I don't know the exact time, something which I really didn't like doing before, though I'd be dragged into dramas on occasion, I never liked it, it was really something I tried to avoid. Usually the Bhakti Siddhanta managed drama I get dragged into because I would have to play Bhakti Siddhanta. Uh, some kind of like physical kind of reason, I think. But um, in the 90s, I started getting a little bit into using drama in communication with people. And it became kind of almost like a kind of like a, a regular part of my communication. People would be dramatic expression, presenting the philosophy through dramatization, which is actually one of the recommended factors of devotional service to present Krishna consciousness in dramatic ways, musical ways, poetic ways, etc. Udava recommends it in that canto. And also by the Sophie, she used to sing Krishna's glories. The Gopis would enact dramas. Rupa Goswami could part many dramas, and others did too. Um, but dramatic presentation, or dramatic expression, is very much a part of our culture. And I started getting an attraction for it for some unknown reason, so I definitely wasn't having any interest in drama of any kind practically before that, other than occasionally being dragged in to a drama. Um, but then suddenly I started getting an attraction for using the involved. Very quickly the taste grew and the enthusiasm grew. I started writing dramas, acting dramas, and directing dramas. <laughs> and, just, and not on a big scale, on, on a spontaneous scale. On, on a, like, you know, but the player for back to the player style at all. Just really basic. And the only purpose was to, to present what I wanted to share with people. Whatever that was, I tried to depict the pastime which expressed those you know, subject matters and try to extract out of each, each, each drama the points which we can you know, apply in our lives, which are significant in our lives. Try to learn. Um, okay, uh, what uh, lessons to learn? Um, well, I would say a lot of my devotional life. After the earlier years, which probably stemmed up to about 78, 78, 70, there about 79, um, which were really almost like, seemed to be one way traffic, just constantly moving forward. Um, but I went, I went least for 15 years of depression. 
without expression almost. Internal depression without expression. Of course, to some extent there's expression during that period. But in general, trying to avoid expression and just carrying on. The strength of those early years and the mercy of Prabhupada and Krishna sustained us. I try to keep going, even though failing in many cases to follow regular principles, failing to, you know, even in things which I just thought were simple, which I thought were, you know, I'd already overcome you, you know. But that, it was at least 15 years of struggle. I got married twice during that period. I mentioned the details of those two marriages, but as an effort to try to, you know, deal with the situation or be honest about it or whatever you wish to call it. Um, but you know, went through some pretty interesting experiences during that period, you don't have time to discuss it. Um, and that darkness, or that period of darkness in one sense was the springboard for, you know, the next mercy, stage of mercy. Um, so I don't regret it for a moment, it was just, but if you let go, you know, if you give up for that period, then of course, maybe shame, but sometimes we do. If someone other was able to hang in there, it was tolerated or whatever it may be during that period. Even that period, I was doing big service sometimes, but internal, internally no. Internally, it was, it was sometimes torture. We went through that period for a while, so. That was not suggesting everyone, or even indicating everyone goes through such a thing, but it's saying whatever you're going through in life, don't let go. Keep chanting and, and you will come, you know, you'll get through it and so on. It's just like a storm. Storms don't last forever, you know. They don't last forever. So just stay on the boat with devotional service. Whatever you, whatever you do, don't blame anyone. One of the biggest things I learned throughout this whole thing was try not to blame anyone. Nobody. Not even that person who did you harm. Or, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> Don't blame them. It's a great success of getting out of Maya. I'm not saying that Maya is. <laughs> I'm just saying it's one of the, one of the points of rele you know, release, let's say. That you stop blaming anyone. You can blame anyone, you can blame yourself, but even that we shouldn't get too mental about it because you end up depressed, you know. <laughs> We have an awful lot to blame ourselves about, you know. But don't we get to that, just recognize we've got some exciting work to do to, to move forward in a positive way, you know. You know, take responsibility for one's own situation. Don't blame others for the situation, that's all. I think we all have to learn that lesson at some point. It was one of the major things that I uh, experienced during that time. Depression. Easier to blame others. Easier. Sometimes we go back to mundane causes, you know. It's simply Krishna. To me, it's just Krishna removing some of the obstacles on our path to allow us to, if we want to, is to uh, take a step forward in devotion. So just releasing us of token reaction, helping, giving us so many realizations. Whatever we find in our life is the, you know, Krishna's will behind it. So experience is something we're meant to experience to release us of causes of further entanglement from our progress in our spiritual lives. Hare Krishna. Is that okay? Hare Krishna. I could say another thing. If you want to take one more thing, I don't know. You're still online. Um, let's say, discovering what honesty means being honest to ourselves. Honest where honesty is, you know, appreciated also. Very, you know, it's a very important thing in life. You know, I'm sorry, you know, Ma, Mahabharata, special. And in any regards, you know, it's like you become a little bit honest, a little bit humbling. It, it evokes the mercy of Krishna. And every every example of his mercy. On the mercy of Krishna. So we're not here to, you know, compete with each other or get some post or anything like that, which we all know. Just being a little bit honest, there's nothing wrong with that. We're here to please Krishna, which means we're here. Lord may not say, you know, which really means going back to God. Um, whether in this world or whatever. 
that it makes you come to that planet form back to Godhead. The Prabhupada's magazine is called Back to Godhead, so it obviously wants us to go back to God. No, but it's not just a physical thing, it's a conscious state of consciousness. Try to be in the sense because that's all our air, what we may call deficiency as well, an artist, whatever. Not just coverings, they're not the soul, the soul's pure. This is the coverings which we have to be cleansed of. Utilize in Christian service purified. So we should get too carried away by the uh, let's say our particular conditions. So just by using Krishna's service. And uh, don't be too shy, don't be too embarrassed. Just find a confidential association to discuss things. You know. It's hard to do you have to sometimes but how to progress, etc. Krishna would help, even if that person Himself, with all sincerity trying, may not be able to, may not have the realization, potency, or the responsibility to help. Um, but just the mentality or the attitude that we do take that from the position that looks Christian to us. I don't think Christian's not in the picture, but he's very much in the picture. He's watching the attitude of moves of everything. I don't think that Christian always moves. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna.